Greetings of the day, everyone. I'm privileged to welcome you all to the third edition of Oran City Literature Festival, organized by SGR Knowledge Foundation in association with GH Raisuni University, powered by Raisuni Group of Institutions, a platform that celebrates wisdom, experiences, narratives, and notions from all walks of life. Having said that, it's thrilling to be here with you all today. And yes, Dikshit, delighted to be your anchor for today's session. Real power comes from not comes not from the barrels of gun, but from who control the narrative. By Mr. Vikram Sood in conversation with Dr. Ashutosh Patokar. Mr. Vikram Sood, a career intelligence officer for 31 years, who retired in March 2003 after heading the RAW, is currently an advisor at the Observer Research Foundation, an independent public policy think tank based in New Delhi. He writes regularly on security, foreign relations, and strategic issues in journals and newspapers. He has contributed chapters related to security, China, intelligence, and India's neighborhood to book published in the last few years. He is an author of best-selling books, The Unending Game, 2018, and Ultimate Goal, 2020. It's an honor to have you with us, Mr. Vikram Sun. And this gets even more delightful as we have Dr. Ashutosh Paturkar, who will be in conversation with him as the moderator. Dr. Ashutosh Paturkar is professor and head of the department at Dr. Ambedkar Institute of Management Studies and Research. He is a, he is a, or he is a recognized supervisor for doctoral students at Rashtrasant Tukhnoji Maharaj University, Nagpur. 11 researchers have received PhD under him till date. He has engaged lectures as an adjunct, adjunct fa faculty at Bits Pilani. He is the author of five elements of organizational excellence. He was the president of Vidharva Management Association 2017 and 18, a life member of Indian Society for Training and Development, and is member of many professional associations. It's an honor to have you with us today, sir. Once again, I welcome you both. Now, my dear audience, you are about to experience a conversation between two very dynamic individuals. So without skipping a moment, I would humbly invite Ashish Tosh Paturkar, sir, to lead us ahead. Please, sir. Thank you very much, Yash, for the nice introduction of myself and as well of uh, Mr. Sood. Many thanks for that. At the onset, I would like to uh, express my deep gratitude and thanks for uh, to OCLF for giving me this opportunity to interact with Mr. Sood. Uh, we have been discussing a few things offline, but interacting with him in person again virtually is a great privilege and honor for me. So, uh, Thank you very much, sir, for joining us this afternoon. It's indeed, as I said, it's a great privilege and honor to be here. Uh, this a book is the ultimate goal and uh, very wonderfully points out that the real power comes not from the barrel of a gun, but from those who control the narratives. So about the power of the narratives, uh, because we know that the wars in time to come are unlikely to be uh, frontal attacks. They're very unlikely to be, or even for that matter, flanking attacks as well, uh, will be very, very rare. Most of the wars will probably be the economic wars or maybe the cyber wars, and uh, probably engaged by the non-state actors also, you know, who are very difficult to trace or uh, identify, where the narrative is going to be more important than the barrel of a gun. Uh, what is also important is that uh, you have to have your narrative very quickly. Uh, so, uh, firstly, sir, I would like to know from you, uh, what is the possibility of a frontal war or a frontal attack? Okay. Well, first of all, let me thank the OCLF for inviting me again to this uh, session for this, this year's festival. I must have done something right to be invited again, so I'm quite happy with that. And it's also great to be talking to Dr. Patulkar because he's, he's, we are now friends on, on, on the screen anyway. We haven't met yet, but it's, it's good to be talking to a familiar person. And it, it helps, I think it helps me in the conversation. 
Now, uh, let me get back, get back quickly to the very deep uh, issue that uh, the doctor has raised. The wars are going to be different, as you yourself mentioned. In fact, you might even say that the wars are already on. It's not blood and guts so much as it is control. There's also control of the mind, control of, as I say in my book, control of the narrative. There's control of resources, the distribution of resources. And economic control where the corporates are sometimes stronger than the state. And the narrative gets built in a matter of minutes. Narratives, that means uh, the tactical narratives, not, not the strategic long-term narrative, but the, the tactical narrative gets built over WhatsApp or Facebook, or we all seen how it happens, how fake stories become true and the truth is blurred. So uh, we we are now in a in a in a very different state and I don't know exactly how we are going to deal with the aspects of artificial intelligence when it becomes full grown. They're already talking about 6G. So uh, are we losing control? Are we letting artificial intelligence take over and then if that intelligence goes rogue, what does happen? What happens to all of us? We are, we, are, we are now playing, we are now, science is, is very good, science is now playing with us too. So wars of the future, they, they, they could, they, I don't mean to rule out skirmishes on the, on the borderline like we've had with Pakistan, we keep having it, we've had with China, we could have them have it again. Those kinds of things will continue. But if you think of a war in the terms of the Great War of the 20th century, and, or, or Vietnam, or uh, I don't think even Afghanistan is going to be repeated in that fashion. We're going to have uh, wars fought with uh, either with uh, um, UAVs, drones, and uh, tactics where you target your opponent from the comfort of your air conditioned con console. And Death there has no meaning because you don't hear the shrieks, you don't hear the cries, you don't hear the sound of the explosion. All you see is a blip. And you don't know how many you've killed and what you've killed and who you've killed. So it's going to be uh, that kind of a war. Who wants to fight that kind of a war is another question. Who wants to fight a war for me, for my sake, any country, can you name one? Who will fight a war for Taiwan? Will the Americans do it? So these are these are things that are, that uh, are up in the air. They are question marks. Everybody wants to have a narrative on everything, but uh, how it is going to play out, we don't know. So in that sense, wars are continuing. Your Cold War has become Cold War II. You've got, instead of Soviet Union, you've got China. It's all the same old game again. You are either with me or against me. And you can't forget um, that you have in, in the, in, close in the background is the Russian, uh, is, is Russia. It's a country that fought and defeated the Nazis the second time and Napoleon the first time. More Russians died in the Second World War than any other country, I think, if I'm not mistaken, at least among the Allies. So um, it, 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 has, it has suffered a lot. It has given a lot. It's not going to go away just like that, just because uh, you won, they won in the, uh, in the um, Afghan uh, Jihad or, or Subsequent to that, the collapse of the Soviet Union. But now it's again, and 
to a different country. So there is that country, and where are we going to fit in all this? And who is going to oppose us? That's the larger question. We can talk about it as we go along. So that's that's what I think. Wars are already on. We don't see them all the time. Who has heard of Ethiopia, Yemen? There's still wars going on. People are dying. Somalia, even Balochistan, people are dying. So it's a it's a it's a world full of contradictions and problems. A big big um, surge. Big churn is taking place. So the old is seems to be receding and the new hasn't come in yet. So some of us dread that, some of us are happy with that. That's a way of life. So I'll stop there, otherwise I keep rambling. No, that's absolutely a, a perfect point that the wars have not stopped. They are still there. Cold War is... Uh, Maybe not directly now between Russia and the United States, but maybe between China and the United States. Yeah. So uh, probably the boundaries have changed a little, but the wars are still uh, there, very much there. Now, in these cases, it is again the narrative which becomes much, much very important. Mm -hmm. The important thing is that unlike the scientific facts or the mathematical equations, uh, which are sacrosanct until proven otherwise, the political facts historical facts and ideas are malleable and can be changed as for the geopolitical convenience. Yeah. This is what is being done also. So scientific proof, scientific proof is rarely required. Mm -hmm. uh, but archaeological facts for history are an exception here. So this conviction is determined by the narratives created. Now, who are the major stakeholders in creating these kind of narratives? Who's got the most at stake is going to create the narrative the most. Now, if the United States says it is a global power, it has global responsibilities, it has the ability, the beings, and the right to put things right wherever they are wrong, therefore it is the one that will create the narrative. It is also able to create narrative. You know, one is the the thought that you will create narrative. The other is to transmit that narrative. Who controls the waves? Who controls the communications? Who controls the media? I mean, which country? Or which part of the globe controls all this? Now, these are the mediums on which you will spread your narrative. And they're, they're controlled there. They're not controlled by us. And narratives are for a purpose. A state wants to seek control or dominate. A colonial power used to come and say, I am superior to you, therefore you are inferior. You don't have a civilization. I gave it to you. When the Aryans came, etc., 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 we've heard all that. The corporate sector is also all about my good is my product is better than yours. Pharma says my product is better than yours. It creates a narrative that only Pfizer can can is the solution to to uh, COVID. Okay, or others are rubbish. Co vaccine is rubbish. Covid shield is rubbish. We we are the ones. They have the means to do it. We don't have the means to say you're wrong. We can shout here, but who cares? So it's about profits for them, therefore they want to control it. There are several high-tech companies, they have their narratives, their own narrative. They're selling products to us, they're giving us product free. Now why on earth would anyone give a product like that free? Why would Google give me the facility of finding my route from here to wherever I want to go free? But it's not free. It comes at a price. They've got your data. So, and that is the one that is sold. That is where the profits are and the advertisements that they get. So, this is 
everything is about control and money yeah absolutely. if you have both you have everything and if you are not able to sell your narrative it's, it's like is a hindi mein kehte hai na jungle mein mor na cha kisne dekha you can have the fanciest gun but nobody knows about it so nobody cares but you have a stupid gun but but you say it's the best and people will believe it maybe and buy it and fight with it and then they will buy some more with it so it goes this is this is how the cycle works at uh, now look for instance this uh, black friday that people keep talking about these days black friday sales a big thing black friday sales first of all let's forget the part that, that this is all a gimmick it's really not not much of a sale but look at look at people have forgotten what the word black friday means in the old american terminology it was the day after thanksgiving thanksgiving thursday next day they would go to a sale of negroes negroes now they don't call them negroes but those days they were niggers that is what it was slaves niggers taunting them they were on display that was black friday and we stupidly are talking about a black friday sale in india that's how commercialized that's how globalization is hum bhi kar rahe hain black friday see so you know this is this is these are narratives you created something out of nothing and you made a sale out of it you made money out of it and then we move on individual narratives to alag baat hai but the state narrative the corporate narrative is the most important thing today um, those who have the means will do it those who don't have the means will have to create the means like you or i we are using uh, western systems of communication we are relying on that we want nothing of our own कल को अगर सब कुछ मान लीजिए विड्रॉ हो जाता है विलम नथिंग ओथेटिकली स्पीकिंग दिस इज नो इंटरनेट फॉर इंडियंस व्हाट विल यू डू यस सिस्टम विल कोलैप्स सो दैट्स अनदर काइंड ऑफ वॉर हाइपोथेटिकली कट ऑफ लिंक्स put them in a cocoon and if cyber war takes you breaks your communication network your trains can't run your air craft can't fly so that's that's how it's going to be so there are multiple stakeholders in developing a particular narrative mm-hmm. not just individual but the state Uh, having political parties political parties have okay. their own narratives about everything you can see it these days farmers have their narratives the sarkar has its own narrative yeah they're carrying on and what's fake and what's true we don't know yeah. so that's absolutely what i was coming to a nation cannot build a credible narrative about its values or if it does not practice freedom at home or if it uh, relies solely on the government machinery to spread a message mm. now such nations uh, do not receive affection and even if they might get some uh, respect or more likely fear so this building narratives and sustaining them is a part of the effort to control storyline which in turn will help control the world the ultimate goal of ambitions and being powerful now freedom of speech is great wonderful that you have a freedom of speech in your country but it has to be mature enough i am saying that the freedom of speech has to be mature enough means uh, it has to be uh, it should not get abused yeah so can we do something in order to get narrative right while maintaining the freedom of speech but you were you're absolutely right dr patulka that if you don't have freedom all you will be left with will be government propaganda yeah now that's horrible 
But that's not a narrative because then you're just being fed from uh, Dr. Gobel's uh, files. So freedoms are essential and freedom of speech and freedom of thought. But you're also very right. Freedoms, my freedom to speak is also curtailed by your freedom of speech. I mean, I can't say I have the freedom of speech to say anything, but you don't. I have my rights, which are also curtailed by your rights. I have a right to drive the car, but only on the left side. So we haven't yet, I don't think we have reached the state of uh, that kind of uh, maturity that we accept what responsible freedom of speech is, which is different from being politically correct. Politically correct is, a, is an expression to, to say that I don't want to say anything. That's not, that's not what it is. I must call a spade a spade, but I must not offend. Abuse is not freedom of speech. Like, like violence is not, not uh, pure violence is not the freedom to defend. So we have, I think with education it comes. First you go into a trough and suddenly you find everybody thinks he's free to say what he likes. And then you have facilities like Facebook and this and that and the other. Everybody wants to have his, his point of view, right or wrong, abusive or non-abusive, whatever. That, that, there can't be any law. I don't think you can do any law or legality about it, but you have to, it, it is something that the society itself must learn to sh to disregard or sh or object or shun. If if somebody is abusive to me on the Twitter, I just want to block him. Keep doing it. Keep doing it. I don't want to respond. I don't want to talk to him. You want to argue with me? Fine. You want to have a dis uh, you know a difference of opinion? We are we are all entitled to our opinions. Say it the way you should be saying it, and I'll accept it. I maybe I'll agree with you. But if you're going to call me your names, I'm not going to talk to you. And we must learn to do that. Not engage them. Not engage an abusive person. The bad man wins because the good keep quiet. That we shouldn't let that happen. And if, I mean, if, 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 10 gundas can get away with it if 100 don't say anything. Today you see on the roadside people send you videographs of an act of violence on the street. But nobody interferes. They just take the shot and move off. So the guy who's doing that, he should be hauled up. What did you do with this? I mean, it's, it's, are you, are you spreading? You're actually spreading hate and violence by doing this. So this kind of freedom has to be institutionally controlled by the platforms, their publishers. They have to be able to control this kind of rubbish that goes on. Because otherwise it just go haywire and then we'll have no control. We'll not know what, what is right, what is wrong in life. What is fake and what is real. So, uh, freedom is, 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 is necessary. I totally agree with you. I totally agree that freedom has to be responsibly exercised. And I also that any violation of this right of an individual or, or overuse of the right should be instantly reprimanded or punished. I saw I saw a video in a in a train somewhere in the United States. A clip: three of two or three black girls 
are beating two Asian, two or three Asians. Everybody in the vestibule is minding his own business. Is that civilization? Is that political correctness? Is it freedom? What is it? Oh, these are these are worrying uh, signs in a in a in a society that we say, we we all admire that they won't let this kind of thing happen in their own country. So this hopefully maybe with time we will get to know like Garebi Hata was a slogan which everybody followed happily. So what happened? Nothing. The slogan also died. Garibi never got out. So those are things that we keep doing ourselves. The Americans went to Iraq based on a narrative which is not true at all. And it got knocked out in the first 10 days of the war. But that didn't mean they'll vacate, they stayed on. So a narrative must have a basis of truth. And we must have the freedom to say what we have to say, but not the freedom to abuse. Exactly. I mean, uh, narratives are about perception of events and goals. Yeah. So, yeah. It's it's not about the fake news. Uh, what mm. we have seen that the amount of trouble that the fake news has been uh, creating. The most important requisite for a narrative to be successfully sold is the receptive audience. You have to have the receptive audience for yeah, your narrative. Yeah, absolutely right. And, yeah, and the external assistance alone cannot create insurgency. That's another problem. Simply by supplying funds and arms. There must be some kind of a local grievance, national, religious, or ethnic, uh, real or imaginary. I mean, we are talking mm -hmm. about the fake news also created over time through propaganda, and uh, which is then exploited by the external entity to create an insurgent movement. And we have seen there are no frontal wars, but then funding of insurgencies, etc., that's happening. And it is must it's much more like advertising. You know, create a brand, a dream mm -hmm. that, and a need for the product what advertising does. So how can we develop brand India for an attribute that it stands for, that she stands for? Important question, long answer. <laughs> you know, for years, I went to school and I was never taught history. And the history I came to know later was warped. And I didn't know. That was the only history that was taught. When I went to college, I had two papers in history. It was British history and uh, medieval Indian history, I think. And it was about kings killing each other and so on. Nothing substantive about the people of that time or nothing. And uh, we never got to know. We were told that Mohanjadaro was an Aryan creation. They are the guys who came, etc., etc. And Alexander had won the war. Now these are stories, and they never talked. The British never ever talked about South India. Yeah. You don't find Cholas or Chalukyas, Pandya yeah. mentioned in their books. Yeah. The only chap they mentioned was Tipu Sultan. So, uh, your history has to be corrected first. Mm -hmm. When you're able to correct your history and put everything as it should be, when I can tell everybody that Alexander did not win the war battle on the banks of the Jhelum, at best it was a draw. And Mr. Alexander had to leave because his people were not going to fight anymore. And then he actually got hit, you know, in the shoulder while going back, and he died subsequently. He was not great, he was a good conqueror, but he didn't make any empire. But you 
the British cannot accept that. Your, your ruler cannot be seen to have been defeated or his kind, the Western European kind, the mother of their civilization, defeated by this little prince in a, in a principality of India, be defeated by him. So he had to be shown as defeated. So what do we get? We get a movie and a yarn. I remember seeing that movie, Rustam, no, Sikandar, Sikandar Yazam, by uh, Surab, um, uh, I forget his name, Prithviraj Kapoor and Surab Modi, okay? Oh. Yeah. Young Ayash would know all this. So, uh, there the scene is that Alexander's wife comes across the river, and gives uh, Porus a rakhi and says, you got to not defend me and my husband. So the next day when they battle, Porus had a chance to kill him, but he holds back. Then the tide turns. Then Surab, then Porus is produced before the king and the king is the grand idol. I give you back your freedom because of what you said just now. These are not make-believe stories. These are legends that we were given. You we made to believe. You we made to believe that the Red Indian was a horrible fellow in America. But the cowboy was the brightest, wonderfulest guy on earth. So those, those are the stories we grew with. We have to correct that impression is still there with many of us, perhaps more with my generation, and that's now on its way out. But we have to take pride in ourselves, to take pride in our inheritance with confidence. We are the oldest civilization, whether right? it's 6,000 or 8,000, 10,000, I don't care. It is the oldest with the oldest religion today. Why shouldn't we take pride? What is it? What is it special that it makes it be like this? It has stayed here for so long. Others have come and gone. So there must be something in us that is that has brought it to to this stage. Christianity came much later. Islam came even much later. So we were there, perhaps forever. It seems in that context. So we have to go back to our inheritance. We have to take pride in our inheritance. We must show it. I mean, the, I think the biggest, the best narratives that are ever told have ever been told are the Ramayana and the Mahabharata. The Gita, I mean, there is so much wisdom, so much narrative, so much story, so much naturalness in the Mahabharata, how, how we scheme and polarize you know, conspire and, and statecraft, everything is there. So, and those are narratives about that period. We have to, what about our temples, for instance, those magnificent temples we've got in the South, particularly. They were built in those days with such scientific accuracy that the sun would beam through one window at one time at another after the, the next equinox, and so on and so forth, every time, or, or every five minutes. There were no computers, there were no winches and cranes, there was no uh, design, but they had the knowledge. If they had the knowledge, where did it come from? Where is it gone? We have to tell the world that we gave them more than just the decimal. Yes. Yeah. And if we say that we have, we have, uh, we have discovered these things in the past. It's there in our chronicles, in our books. We have to write about. It, we have to talk about. It, we have to take pride in it. Tourism, for instance. It, okay, you don't have the means to communicate things like uh, Reuters or AFP or CNN you can do it. Flash news the world over. You do your tourism right. You. You get millions of people into your country. 
show them yourself showcase yourself and they'll carry back stories you know france gets the equivalent of its own population as tourists every year 60 million now if we were to get 1 billion tourists every year imagine the difference it would make to 1 billion people who come go back with a happy impression statistically speaking in 10 years you would have covered the whole world right they would have gone back with a happy impression of this country about itself about its past but we don't do it we only think that if you go there and or and if you go there and take 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 some books and pamphlets they'll be impressed no they're not impressed it's your art your culture we have so much of it absolutely but there are yeah but just one more thing yes but sir. let us not forget that we cannot live in the past so we have to make a make sure that we tell them that we got this huge huge basket shall i say what should i say of talent in the country of young young talent who can i mean how how is microsoft and how are google running because there are so many indians working there yeah. so if they can do it there why can't we make them do it here for us why do we send our people to iits and don't give them an opportunity in india to excel when I mean, if there's a bright chap who can continue his with his research on whatever he is doing in india at an institute of of equal standing why not why don't we have any university in the top 50 in the world that's where your strengths will be that's where your narratives will be put 10 universities of that quality there will change your concept your perceptions but we don't have any we just khol ke baith jate hain colleges without any meaning what is the skill Don't develop any skill. A carpenter is somebody who learned his carpentry at home. He never been to school. A plumber has done the same thing. We have no mid-level skills in the country. I'm I'm straying. I'm sorry. No, that's perfect. Because uh, two important points that you have raised. Uh, you did mention that is a small question, long answer. but two very important points one was about the movies now at the cia considered films to be an ideal means of communication to send the pro democracy messages to countries with higher mm-hmm. levels of illiteracy mm-hmm. when we have the examples like films like uh, zero dark 30 was good for cia as they drew public support for its activities and for the national security stake there are attempts in india as well but on which front do you think contribution from indian films will help india create a positive narrative we are running short of time there is another one that is also about oh. uh, leveraging cultural heritage as well okay okay so okay it's, what do you expect from the uh, movies uh, how they can contribute to our narrative you know i've been seeing some of the latest films that come out on on the in, on the small budget realistic films they talk about semi urban in india small town in india small town aspirations those are those are endearing films that tell you who you are and it's not uh, all all uh, razzmatazz of uh, bollywood and uh, films like uh, udham singh do you see have you seen sardar udham It's a wonderful movie. Why has it taken us seventy-five years to make it? We don't know because nobody wanted to portray anybody else but a few other people to be the heroes. So everybody is out. Why hasn't there been a movie in Subhash Bose so far? 
Hasn't there been a movie? Hasn't there been a good production of a movie about Shahid Bhagat Singh? And the only movie we produced um, recently was uh, this one, uh, Rani of Jhansi, Mani Karma. So we have to produce history books. We have to produce. We have to produce. This, Slick documentaries. Yes. Of the National Geographic scale, if you get the model I'm looking at, mm -hmm. where it is true story about a village or a, a tribe or a farmhouse or or an activity that has gone on in India for years and years. I mean, a, a documentary on uh, Dr. Korean would be an excellent thing to do. That's India. He's given us from nothing to everything, as far as milk is concerned. Yes, yes. What, what? Why don't we idolize our present-day heroes and bygone heroes? Tabhi to confidence aayega na amme ke you know that we can do all this. Yes. So. Zero Dark Thirty was a movie which was the CIA made to prove also that torture would lead to results. You get interrogation, karoge, what they call enhanced interrogation, and you'll get the truth. Hmm. And that is all, all rubbish, but that's how it was done. And they made movies like Guns of Never on River. Bridge over river, well, there's no river quite anywhere. Right. But it's a good story. It sold. We made a lot of money. We proved their allies were such wonderful fellows. Nobody is history has been written by the allies, not by the Germans. It's always written by the victors. That's right. so, Sir, we are completely running out of time. One final question that I have is how exactly corporatization of war works? That's the final question that I have. How uh, it's, it's a very interesting question. War is about profits. Who sells the weapons? Who makes the weapons? If tomorrow there were peace, Total peace in the world. Total peace. Who loses? All your companies in America, in Britain, in France, Germany, Russia, close down. How many people will lose jobs? How many, uh, how many uh, congressmen or MPs? Will not get their handouts. Uh, so this is you corporatize the war. Then you have introduced private corporations running your ancillary services like uh, infrastructure maintenance. Like you had, the, India has the Army Supply Corps. There they gave it to. Brown and Root and somebody else to give all the goodies, provide all the rations, put up all the buildings. Even security guards and the perimeter security was privatized. Blackwater is there. Dyncorp is there. Dyncorp was providing security to the Pakistan president, private company. So it's it's it's. It's a wonderful situation where everybody can get some money out of it. So, if you, if you, um, tomorrow, if you say everybody all become healthy and fine and no, no, no medicines required, what happens to your pharma industry? They rely on you and I being ill. They rely on you and I being at war rather than at peace. Yes. That is the moral. <laughs>
Yes, sir. We are completely running out of time, but we do come to a conclusion that the real power comes not from the barrel of a gun, but from those who control the narratives. And narratives yes. are very, very important. Uh, thank you very much, sir, for your insight on how to develop these narratives. You have done it wonderfully in the book as well. Uh, and uh, now also some of the uh, insights that you have given will definitely help us also and develop some narratives over a period of time. Thank you very much, sir, on personal behalf as well as on behalf Thank of the OCLF. And I hand over it back to Yash. Thank you very much for having us uh, here on OCLF. What an insightful session. At the out outset, I would like to thank Vikram Sukh sir and Dr. Ashutosh Patorkar sir for joining us today. We wish to get to hear you both again and equally enlightened as we all are today. And for my dear Matt's audience, I'm sure that after witnessing this conversation, you all are taking home an enriched version of yourself, just as I am. Thank you for joining us today. Until I see you again, this is your direction signing off. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Bye. Beyond.